Hello, and welcome to this recording of my presentation. I'm Jessica Brown, and my paper is entitled Eyes for Avonlea, Ella Montgomery's Affective Vision of Nature. Um, I'll begin my paper shortly, but first I'll just introduce myself. I'm a PhD student at the University of Limerick. I'm earning my degree in creative writing. I'm also studying narrative theory and affect theory. I'm also a writer. I've published a novel for middle grade readers called um, The River Boy, and its sequel is hopefully coming out this summer called Penny's Story. Also last October, my collection of poetry came out with Revival Press here in Limerick. And as a segue into this paper, this collection is full of nature poetry. And I must um, owe my indebtedness to Ella Montgomery. It is she who taught me how to see nature. Um, Rachel Carson wrote that those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. And I have found that to be particularly true these last two months, few months. My, um, my Ella Montgomery books have traveled around the world with me, and she has taught me to see nature in many different places. But when Ireland was in lockdown with a 2K limit of movement, this little harbor nearby became a daily fount of courage, comfort, and hope. And I thank Maud for that, and also the global community of Montgomery scholars, helping me to receive those affects when I walk by trees and water and under clouds and besides flowers. So I am now going to begin my paper. Eyes for Avonlea, Ella Montgomery's Affective Vision of Nature. For more than a century now, humans have been reading passages of nature writing from the hands of Ella Montgomery. These passages are woven into her narratives, texturing her story worlds with layers of sonorous, generous, entwined life. It's so much more than the label nature writing allows. Birch skin, shadowed wood, dappled light, endless varieties of dusk and dawn, prismatic colors of the sea, Surpassing mere descriptive prose, Montgomery's vision of nature thoroughly registers how nature impresses and impinges upon the assemblages within it, from fictive forms of character and narrative to amorphous qualities of a story's mood and atmosphere. As such, in the next 20 minutes, I query paragraphs of descriptive prose from Anna Green Gables with aspects of affect theory in order to explore Montgomery's vision of nature as affective strata in her Avonlea story world, moving toward the question of how this vision of nature in turn affects her readers. So before the close readings, I'd like to connect this presentation with current and exciting work on Montgomery and nature. Rita Bode and Jean Mitchell edited the 2018 book, Ella Montgomery and the Matter of Natures, and their introduction is exactly my entry point as well, in that I hope to extend the critical conversations about Montgomery and nature from key concerns of aesthetics and romanticism into conversations that see Montgomery's configuration of nature as affective, connective, and transformative and readers' experiences of these configurations as a pedagogic encounter. In all that's emerging in environmental humanities, eco-philosophy, and even the vibrant strands of post-critique, this introduction is really timely material. In it, Bode and Mitchell write that while Montgomery's relationship with nature aligns well with the critical view that places her in the literary traditions of the British Romantics, their book brings a new understanding to Montgomery and the subject of nature through a multidisciplinary approach and a critical environmental awareness that embraces the concept of nature as expansive, inclusive, and varied. Insightfully, before, um, insightly, insightfully, before bringing Montgomery and nature beyond a British Romantic context, Bode and Mitchell show how even from within that context, there are important divergences, such as Montgomery's avoidance of nature only to provide from a subject-centered vantage or appropriation. 
Bowdoin Mitchell specifically see nature and nature as Montgomery wrote it as, quote, material and interrelated, two words that befit a starting point for this project of applying affect theory, which works with an ontology of radical connectivity and transversive multivectoral becomings. So with that said, I would quickly like to present affect theory as I am using it here from among all the different source texts and very varied lineages in this field, I use Jill Deleuze's book on the 17th century philosopher Baruch Spinoza, Spinoza, Practical Philosophy. In this work, Deleuze presents aspects of Spinoza's philosophy that theorize a world where beings affect and are affected. Primary to this affectivity is Spinoza's concept of connectivity, which sees, which is the imminence of God or nature in all atoms and all the universe. For Deleuze Spinoza, affectivity involves the capacity to effectuate effective force, the capacity to be affected, and the experience of being affected as well as all the states of transition in between and all the vectors coming and throwing to make it happen. What we find here is not just a tangled and entangled cosmos, but a reconfiguration of moral capacity as to how involved or isolated a body is. Deleuze Spinoza offers a move from systems of morality that are often normative into a practical and connected uh, systems of learning to live with more responsiveness. So this is not an abandonment of ethics, but an ethics that is embedded in a quote, kinetic and dynamic reality of responsiveness. Deleuze writes, the important thing is to understand life, each living individuality, not as form or a development of form, but as a complex relation between different velocities. So not simply an overlap with emotion, affect is bodily, processual, atmospheric, and shifting. Without denying it personal, phenomenological, cognitive, and linguistic registers, it can be transpersonal, collective, other than language, and far from cognition. What makes work in affect theory so helpful is the willingness to trace how wide, deep, narrow, and surface, and beyond measure affectivity can be, as well as the things involved, animal and plant life, of course, but even processes like tides and nightfall. This philosophy to me offers a very inspiring way of into the nature passages of Anne of Green Gables. So to start then is a simple paragraph from the fourth page about windows in a house called Green Gables. Its windows looked east and west. Through the west one, looking out on the backyard, came a flood of mellow June sunlight. But the east one, whence you got a glimpse of the bloom white cherry trees in the left orchard and the nodding slender birches down in the hollow by the brook, was greened over by a tangle of vines. So informed by affectory lenses, what can we see here? The first is orientating this locale and connecting it with east and west. For Deleuze, the latitudinal and the longitudinal do not pinpoint but stretch and extend. So rather than locking down the house, this orientation gives a sense of extension or pushing outward toward opposite horizons. It makes me think of Bowdoin Mitchell's introduction, the realms of human and nature, not just coexistent, but coextensive. The phrasing of a flood of mellow June sunlight uh, creates a zone that is atmospheric and encompassing. It's not just mention of sunlight or kind of setting sunlight in its place for this scene. The light is mellow, which conjures a pervasive melting softness upon and within its atmosphere. There's also a flood of it. This sunlight is washing over things, interacting with them. Next, to the east, the description does not only offer the fact of white cherry trees, but the bloom of white cherry trees. Bloom generates more than an image of trees in their strict form. It offers radiating presence, a connective element in the way the trees push into the surround. And finally, 
lovely phrase, greened over by a tangle of vines. Greened is used as an adjective for the window, as well as a verb of what the vines have been up to, sending a mist of color over a window space, such that the sharp outline of a group of leaves undulates into a layer of color. It is not only vines that generate this, but a tangle of vines. The word tangle evokes that netted and twining patterning that is so vital to comprehending nature as an effective strata that is like connective tissue. This simple short paragraph shows Montgomery's incredible ability to conjure atmospheric, extensive, impinging properties from seemingly stable forms of nature. Each descriptive turn stretches boundaried forms, blooming out from set places with permeating, permeable presence. The second passage is from the novel's opening paragraph, well known and oft analyzed. Mrs. Rachel Lind lived just where the Avonlea main road dipped down into a little hollow, fringed with alders and ladies' eardrops, and traversed by a brook that had its source way back in the woods of the old Cuthbert Place. It was reputed to be an intricate headlong brook in its earlier course through those woods, with dark secrets of pool and cascade. But by the time it reached Lind's hollow, it was a quiet, well-conducted little stream. So this passage, this passage seems a perfect specimen to look at, even simplistically, through different lenses about Montgomery's vision of nature. First, we can have our romantic vision of a stream as a site to gaze at in its intricacies, as well as mark its progress or regress from wild to domesticated. We see the Ruskin-esque writerly act of minute observation detailing botanical specificity in order to capture and comprehend how beauty works. We see here the moves of anthropomorphism and perhaps could deconstruct it as engaging in a kind of appropriation reflective of colonialism, though we could respond as Bowdoin Mitchell do with Jane Bennett's reevaluation that at least anthropomorphism creates, quote, a chord between person and thing. With these theories at play, I would like to look at this passage for its affective elements. Here, the word traverse is key. In Deleucian cartography, being able to move across spaces is a really important capacity. It means that things can become, that lines of flight can be taken, that new, unknown, and unimaginable territories can be traveled into. It is powerful that this novel starts with the movement and energy of water crossing, flowing, unfolding, falling, exerting, and even changing. This ontology of the potential for movement previews the stories ahead, especially the entwined becomings of Marilla and Anne. Okay, the third passage also contains that lovely word, tangle. A cool wind was blowing down over the long harvest fields from the rims of furry western hills and whistling through the poplars. One clear star hung over the orchard and the fireflies were flitting over in Lover's Lane, in and, among, in and out among the ferns and rustling, rustling boughs. Anne watched them as she talked and somehow felt that the wind and stars and fireflies were all tangled up together into something unutterably sweet and enchanting. It's such a beautiful passage. Um, so here, nature is rendered as a strata that throbs with life and affecting forces. Making a couple of lists, there are things, animate and inanimate, fields, hills, poplars, star, orchard, fireflies, lane, boughs. There are forces and processes, coolness, wind, blowing, whistling, harvest, flitting, rustling, watching, talking. There are locales and orientations, down, rims, western, through, over, in and out, among, together. In this short space, Montgomery surges language so that all these itemized elements merge, melt, and morph into something, into a something, a beyond nominative tangle that is sweet and enchanting. 
The emergence of enchantment particularly speaks to an effective puissance. As Jane Bennett argues, enchantment is involvement, the ability to affect, and when enchanted, the ability to be affected. But it is, it is distinct, Bennett writes, from awe. Enchantment is a state of interactive fascination, not fall tyranny's awe. The overall effect of enchantment is a mood of fullness, plenitude, or liveliness, a sense of having one's nerves or circulation or concentration powers turned up or recharged. It is Anne's keen sensitivity that responds to the swell of enchantment, and we are in her zone of close third-person point of view when the something unutterably sweet and enchanting is felt and registered. Indeed, Anne is an incredibly sensitive radar to the effective forces of nature. Her capacities for being entwined and enchanted are off the scale compared to other characters. So what about a character who is less sensitive or responsive? Does nature still function with affective force then? Look at this passage. She, Marilla, probably imagined that she was thinking about the aides and their missionary box and the new carpet for the vestry room. But under these reflections was a harmonious consciousness of red fields smoking into pale purply mists in the declining sun, of long, sharp pointed fir shadows falling over the meadow beyond the brook, of still crimson budded maples around a mirror like wood pool, of awakening in the world and a stir of hidden pulses under the gray sod. From a Delusian point of view, the edges here are melting and blurring into a rise of becoming, in this case, of, of springtime. And though Montgomery makes clear that Marilla is not cognitively registering these natural elements falling around each other, the force of their presence still resonates into Marilla with the affect of gladness. The effects of, the affects of nature fill the story world with active zones of natural, biological, meteorological, botanical, mineral livingness, far more than static scene setting or even detailed fit, feats of description. This generates a story world ontology of interactivity between everything from human to stellar temperature to insect. Before leaving this idea of the story world making, I would like to look at the effective force of, force of nature woven into narrative move, movement. We might normally distinguish between the descriptive and the narrative, but Montgomery melds these together so that they unfold with reliant and, and riveted involvement. Here is one example early in the book when Anne and Marilla are returning from Mrs. Lynn. Anne said no more until they turned down into their own lane. A little gypsy wind came down to meet them, laden with the spicy perfume of young dew-wet ferns. Far up in the shadows, a cheerful light gleamed out through the trees from the kitchen at Green Gables. Anne suddenly came close to Marilla and slipped her hand into the older woman's hard palm. We can list the affective sensorium here. Wind, perfume, wetness, shadows, cheer, gleams. What emerges from this tangle though is not enchantment, but affection. Indeed, it seems that the character movement, which is Anne's hand reaching out to Marilla's and the psychological connection between the two is earned narratively by the puissance of the natural elements. As a storyteller, Montgomery knew what she was doing. The influencing presence of nature heralds in such character movement, not just poetically, but believably. So considering the space now between text and reader, from an eco-philosophical point of view, Montgomery offers, offers a mattering experience of nature. And this has the potential to become a pedagogic encounter for the readers. She teaches us to see nature with new eyes, eyes for Avonlea, such that have the chance to register how involved nature is with our own existence, such that the seeming lines between us and the natural world are re-understood to be shared zones of potential becoming.
The way her nature seeps across the imagined story world equips us to see nature that way with our real planet. Here is a final passage, which comes at the end of the novel. I won't read it all. When Anne finally left the graveyard and walked down the long hill that sloped to the Lake of Shining Waters, it was past sunset and all Avonlea lay before her in a dreamlike afterlight, a haunt of ancient peace. The beauty of it all filled, thrilled Anne's heart and she gratefully opened the gates of her soul to it. Dear old world, she murmured, you are very lovely and I am glad to be alive in you. We've looked at a few passages now, so I can imagine you can spot those affective features that stretch and bloom, seeming boundaried elements into forces of interchange. And here, the passage ends with the declaration of thankfulness for being inside it all. More than a call for attentive observation, this is a re-envisioning of how we position ourselves in the world. The position emerges as a within, an embedded and networked version of self whose capacity to be affected is of utmost value. In Mitchell and Bode's introduction, they echo Irene Gamble's call for future research to look beyond the visual conventions in Montgomery's work and to recognize the painterly appreciation inscribed in the text as a screen for covering more radical and covert subtexts that effectively break the Cartesian body-mind split. Seeing with Montgomery's vision of nature means that readers have the chance to experience the value of that withinness. And one last word in her book, Staying with the Trouble, one last paragraph, in her book, Staying with the Trouble, Donna Haraway coins a term responsibility for how we can live not just on, but with, as she calls it, our damaged earth. Like Bennett's ethos of enchantment as interchange, this ethos of responsiveness cultivates a care for our earth, not from imposed civic structures, but from the realization of how intertwined our biostrata is with us as one of many moving parts. Pine trees, warm wind, moon glow. We have been taught by Montgomery's vision of nature, a mode of response, that recognizes how generative these elements are for our own acts of meaning making. Nature, enfolded and unfolding with us, is a force that matters. We are tied to its troubles as well as to its splendors. Thank you so much for listening and warmest regards from Killaloo.